That, uh, <coughs> that story about the, um, the galaxy, could you, could you understand it all? I don't know, if the, was it clear? Did you get the story? Because actually, there was a sign on the galaxy which said, our solar system is somewhere here. So that was the actual, that was the, the story slightly more accurately. And uh, so anyway, the, I think he used, he, did, he used that on several occasions because it's such a, um, um, there's nothing you can say really to that. Um, Lena and I have been here a couple of weeks now and we've been making this documentary, we've been doing interviews and really what got, what I felt the whole thing was about was actually getting Babaji's darshan and this word darshan, you all know what the word means, darshan the, the word darshan is is the sight of the deity and that's not really simply an external deity, it's actually the real darshan is when you get the darshan of your own self, you might say. Although self's not really quite the right word. It's not self in the sense that we use it. And um, I remember doing, after the first day of filming with Dean and Leo, um, we were going to do some more filming the next day. And I thought, I really can't wait to go and see Babaji. Because that's what it felt like. It felt like having his darshan. And when you think about the guru, then there's an expression, isn't there? When two or three gather together in my name, there am I. So that's in a way what we're doing. It's not just hearing me telling a bunch of stories. It's getting the darshan. It's allowing the darshan to happen. And that requires a little bit of patience and it sort of reveals itself. So kind of, I hope we can sort of go there, all of us, and get a little taste of, of this thing called Dashan. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about um, how I came to meet Prakashananda. Uh, I was a very, um, dare I say it, typically screwed up Westerner. I, uh, I had a public school background, which didn't do me a whole lot of favors. I had a difficult relationship with my father. I had a very unhappy love affair, and I thought, right, I'm getting out of here. And I actually went to Australia and New Zealand. I, went, I came to Australia in 1970, arrived in Geelong in a, in a merchant ship, and then went to New Zealand. And I sort of thought I was gonna, is that okay? Yeah. I actually started in Israel, in fact, because um, I was in Israel at the time. And I sort of thought that when I got to New Zealand, I was going to find it. Because New Zealand sort of ticked all the boxes. It was a long way away from the pains of my, of my previous life, really. It was away from my parents and it was away from this unhappy love affair. And when I got to New Zealand, it was beautiful, but it wasn't it. It was definitely not it. And after about a year and a half, I, went to I came to Australia. And I was in Sydney and um, I was walking past this, sh this shop. And the shop had a sign in the shop. In, in, uh, inside and it said the kingdom of heaven is within and it, it, struck, it struck me like a ton of bricks I, I felt I haven't been told something here quite what it means I have no idea what does that mean I really have no idea what that meant <laughs> after some time I about a year and a half in Australia I went to Indonesia and I guess for most of us, spiritual life is so, in a way, counterintuitive. The 
that you really need something to happen to you, like a wound. You kind of need a wound. And then you go to the doctor. If you're doing fine, you don't really go to the doctor. So you kind of need your wound in a funny kind of way. So I, I kind of had quite a decent wound actually. And I was pretty unhappy little guy. I went to Indonesia and I studied meditation because I felt this that meditation might be the answer. It might be the might lead me out of my pain, really. And I had an extraordinary experience of universal consciousness, um, which I think was given because I, I needed to be shown something um, completely beyond myself. And um, it was a it was an experience of of where we all come from. And Babaji would call that the Guru Principle. Guru Tattva. Guru Principle. And that Guru Principle is in all of us. But it takes a bit of finding. And the process of finding it is called sadhana in the English, in the Indian culture. So, to cut a long story short, I I went to India after Indonesia, and let me just say one thing. Actually, one little interesting thing is I was never very good at relationship. I was a kind of a typical human being in that way, because it's such a difficult one. And the day after I had this sort of cosmic experience, as it were, after I was given this experience, my girlfriend from Australia arrived in Indonesia, actually in, in central Java. She arrived the very next day. And the message I got was, you know, you need to actually learn the basics, mate as they say in Australia. I really got that message strong. And I knew I had a lot of work to do. At that time, I was, I, I was very much into seeking power. And I thought that I used to do all sorts of practices, um, like sitting water and repeating a mantra. These are things in, in central Java they do a lot and actually led me, in the, led me in the wrong direction, pretty much in the wrong direction. So I want to um, sort of take you all with me to India now. So just kind of let yourself come along. I mean, Babaji came from a very Indian culture. You got that from seeing that. In fact, some of it was quite hard to understand, particularly the Indian. Uh, the Indian lady, Mrs. Rajhans, with Dr. Rajhans, quite difficult to understand. And the Indian culture is very, is quite difficult to understand. It takes a bit of getting, getting used to. And so I just want to tell you a little bit what it was like for me arriving in India and sort of hopefully take you with me. So I arrived in Bombay at the beginning of 76, 1976. And when I woke up, actually I slept in the waiting room in Bombay Airport. The first impression of Bombay was a sweltering place. Completely different planet to anything I've ever, ever been to before. Hot. <sighs> Colorful. Anyway. I slept in the waiting room in Bombay Airport. When I woke up, there was a scene unfolding in front of me. And the scene was something like this. There was a, a man in a turban surrounded by his disciples. And there was a sweetness in this scene that was like, I knew this was, this was India's gift 
that I was being shown, there was some essence of the Indian bhakti, what they call bhakti, devotion, devotion to the guru, devotion to God, which is very much part of the Indian psyche. It's there in a way that we don't really have. The West is very much about the ego. <laughs> in India, they still have this, devo this devotion, this devotional tendency. And what I saw, it's like it felt like a good omen. I then went to Ganesh Puri, Ganesh Puri Ashram. Has anyone here ever been to Ganesh Puri? So few people have been. So Ganesh Puri is Baba Muktananda's ashram. And has anyone met Baba Muktananda? Yeah, yeah, a few people. Okay. So, um, what you do, when you go to Ganesh Puri Ashram, you kind of get thrown into India. You cannot get to Ganesh Puri Ashram without having your eyes opened a little bit about what India is all about. So the heat, the colors, the smells, it's an overwhelming experience, almost unlike anything you've ever seen before. And one of the things about the Indian Psyche, it's somehow different to ours. Instead of being lots of little individuals with individual agendas running around separately, they're somehow, they're not, they haven't got the separate consciousness in the same way as we have. And I really received that. I really got that. I thought there's something very different about India. And I really like it. I felt very at home straight away. I think a lot of people have that experience. And Mother India can be very kind and very cruel. Mother India can really give you a hard time or she can just take you like a mother and you're never the same again. She feeds you with her milk. So, all these impressions and I arrived in Ganesh Puri Ashram. And Ganesh Puri Ashram is in the middle of the hinterlands north of Bombay. Very, very primal place. Very few trees. Extraordinary, actually. Like another planet in some ways. And the bus kind of bounced along this single track road and went on and on and on and on. And finally I saw this kind of palatial building emerging out of the heat haze. And I thought, my God, it can't be, this can't be Ganesh Puri Ashram, surely. And the driver said, Ganesh Puri Ashram? Which meant, yes, it was. So I got out, not knowing what to expect, and walked into this place. And when you go into Ganesh Puri Ashram, it's like, it's a bit like being born. You go through this little opening in the wall, there's a wall all around the ashram. And you go through the little opening. It's like being born in some way. And you come to this temple, which is the Nityananda temple. Nityananda was Muktananda's guru. And you realize I'm right in India. This is the, this is the Indian, this is the Indian thing. There was a statue of Nityananda who was black as coal, very black, came from South India. There was a, a statue of him giving me the blessing of him. And I went into the ashram and the whole ashram was really about Muktananda's devotion to Nityananda. So this guru-disciple relationship is really, really strong in India. It's to understand, you've, to understand uh, India, in a way, you have to understand this, this guru-disciple relationship. Mahatma Gandhi had disciples as this whole um, tradition. So, what happened was, on that very first evening, there was, up in the men's dormitory, there was about 12 Westerners at that time, this was 1976, and there was this rather strange man dressed in brown, Kind of like a sadhu, except he was a westerner and he had red hair. <laughs> a 
and it was Dean. And Dean very kindly sort of took an interest in me, although I was new. And he sort of took me under his wing a bit and he kind of, he was kind to me, you know, because I just didn't know the ropes at all. And he started talking to me about this. He said he was actually visiting from his guru's place in a place called Saptashrin. And I said, oh yeah. I said, where's Saptashrin? He said, oh, it's about a hundred miles from here, you know, it's way, way in the hinterlands of India. And he said, um, you know, Baba had a, has a realized disciple called Prakashananda. And um, he comes and visits, you know, from time to time to Ganeshpuri Ashram. When Baba's away, he comes and he kind of, you know, he stays a few days, he keeps an eye on things, and uh, you, should, you should try and meet him. So I got, the very first day I heard about Prakashananda. And what I also got from Dean was this, is, this was a very different kind of man to Muktananda. Muktananda was a king, He was pretty in your face, he was very fiery. And Prakashananda was very traditional and humble, humble man. So very different in a way. So I kind of got this in the first day. So what happened was that the heat was happening fast. In India, the heat happens In that part of India, in April and May, it gets ferocious, and it was getting hotter. And I stayed in the ashram for some time, but it was getting really uncomfortably hot. Now, what I always did in a situation like this, I would always run. I was always run, that was my policy. I ran when things got uncomfortable. I don't know, maybe that rings a bell, maybe a lot of us do that. But, I thought, I think I'm going to get out of here. It's getting too hot. And I want to go to a place called Tiruvannamalai, which is Ramana Maharshi's place, this is it to go to. So I went into Bombay and I bought this ticket to Tiruvannamalai. I came back to the ashram. And I was going to go to Tiruvannamalai in, I don't know, a couple of days' time. I had this little ticket, which is my escape, my escape. My escape from myself, actually. And when the day, the day before I was going to leave, this conflict started inside myself. Huge, huge conflict. And the conflict was something like, you need to make a stand. For once in your life, you need to make a stand and just see what happens. It's actually surrender. This idea of surrender is something very alien to me. It was... It's very alien to the Western mind in a way. We think of surrender as being something weak, whereas I was being asked to do something strong here, which was surrender by not moving on, not just obeying my instincts to run away. So I tore up the ticket, and a week later, Prakashananda came to the ashram. Muktananda was away at the time. And the first time I ever saw Prakashananda was, I was, was in the garden, and we used to work in the garden. All, everyone had to work, work in the garden. It was a big emphasis on working. And this man came walking down the path with a few other people. And there was something about him which I was, at, I was immediately attracted to him. Something about the way he walked, the way he moved, his expression. There was something that communicated itself to me. And you could say this is, this is a form of darshan. Something was communicated, which I recognized. And I went up to him. And I think I touched his feet, because I thought that's what you're meant to do. You're meant to touch the the Mahatma's feet. The Mahatma, Mahatma means great soul, Mahatma. So I touched his feet. And he sort of looked amused and looked terribly impressed with me. (laughs) 
Um, and I started to go and visit him. He stayed in the ashram in a place called Turiya Mandir. This is a place a little bit away from the main ashram, and he had a room there. And people would go and sit with him, and he'd tell stories. That's what he really did was tell stories. In the middle of the story, you got his presence. You got his, you got his darshan. You got his transmission. And this transmission is, is, you know, you could say is the guru principle, is the, the power of the guru. This is the, the essence, the guru tattva. And I really picked up that something was coming out of him that was just pure love, that was profoundly mystical, that was mysterious. I thought, this is what a human being can be. And like all in one, I just, this is what a human being can be. And that was a revelation. To see the magnificence of a human being, what a human being can attain, was shown to me in the presence of this man. His humility, it's like all the, everything I've ever read, all the scriptures I've ever read, was just summed up in the presence of this man. So, I started going to see him up in Turiya Mandi, and he was staying for a few days, and I found myself saying, will you give me Diksha? Diksha is initiation. Now, the sadhana around Muktananda, and around Prakashananda for that matter, is this thing that's called Shaktipat. I don't know if you, you, you will know this word, Shaktipat? It's the transmission of the guru which awakens the, the kundalini energy. This is the, the way that Indian culture talks about it. We don't have anything quite, we don't have in our culture an acknowledgement of this power that is within everybody. In India, it's very much out there. So, what you do is you approach the guru and you beg him to initiate you. That's the disciples, that's what the disciple does. If you feel like you really, really want what the guru has to give, if you're at that point, then that's what you do. You go and beg him for diksha, initiation. So, I said, Babaji, um, you know, will you, will you give me diksha? I mean, in a very foolish way, really. And he sort of looked quite amused. And I think he must have thought, this guy hasn't got a clue. And he was right. I really didn't have a clue. I was so green and so full of myself. And he said, come tomorrow morning. So the next morning, uh, I, had, I actually went at about something like four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning, because in India, things start pretty early. And um, I took a, I think I took a coconut and I took a flower mala and I took some money, whatever it was. And he, I went into his room and he completely ignored me. He completely ignored me. I thought, what is going on? He told me he was going to give me a diksha. So finally I said, uh, Babaji, uh, you said you'd give me a diksha this morning. He said, not today. No. No. Just like that. Just. And I thought, oh my God. You know, in the West you don't, you don't, you don't do that. I mean, it's, you know, he said he'd give me a diksha. What's going on? So anyway, he said, come back tomorrow. So the next morning I came back with the same coconut and the same flower mala. And the same thing happened. He completely ignored me. And this time I thought, I had the whole day to think about it. And I realized that he didn't, the reason he didn't give me diksha was because I was not ready for diksha. I was so full of myself. I didn't go to him with real humility at all. I was full of myself. 
I was full of ego. And when I got that, when I saw that, it was like a knife inside me and I saw something in myself. I saw that this is where I come from. I come from this position of ego all the time. And I could see that it was this, it was this ego that was actually causing me so much pain. I, kind of, I really got that. So, you know, a really important thing happened during the daytime when I just threw him ignoring me. So the next morning I went and he gave me a diksha. So he, he knew my process. I had no doubt about it. He knew exactly what was going on with me. And afterwards he said, you're mine now. It's an extraordinary thing to say. Extraordinary thing to hear. So the guru accepts a disciple. I, I certainly did not deserve to be, to be accepted. But he accepted me. And that was the beginning of my, my, my journey with Prakashananda. Mm -hmm. Feels like we need a tea break at that point, but I'm going to tell you a bit more. <laughs> so, what I'm going to, what I hope to do, if you'll bear with me, is everything, is everybody okay with it? Are you okay? Can you hear me? Are you going to sleep? Is it okay? Are you receiving, are you receiving this? Okay. So, I said to Babaji, Babaji was going to go back to Saptashrin, this mysterious place called Saptashrin. And his visit was over. And I said, Babaji, I'd really like to come and visit you up in Saptashrin. Can I do that? He said, yes, you can come. Then he left. About a week later, I <laughs> left the ashram. And it was quite difficult to leave the ashram because, you know, my Westerner friends were there. I think Dean by that time had gone back to Saptashring. But it was kind of nice being in this kind of mothership, the Ganeshpur ashram. And it felt like being ejected out into the wilds of India where I had no idea what I'd find. It was like, I don't know. And so I got on a bus. And I had these instructions on how to go to this place called Saptashring. I got on a bus and I went to a place called Nasik. And that was about five, five hours on this bus. Dum, 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 just. And I finally got to Nasik and I got a smaller bus to a place called Nanduri. And by this time it was, a, it was in the late afternoon and this bus bumped along and we just went further and further into the hinterlands. And I got such a feeling of the primal quality of where we were going. And out of the heat haze I could see these mountains appearing just out of the heat haze. Big mountains. You're talking about 5,000 feet mountains. And the bus got nearer and nearer and then went right up to the foot of one of the mountains and then went around it and stopped in a place called Manduri. And I knew that this was where you start to walk up the mountain. So I thought, okay, got out of the bus, had my little rucksack and started to walk and walk and walk and walk. And this path it was like arriving on the moon, I do not exaggerate. There was virtually no vegetation, it was rock, and it was austere, there was an austerity about this place, it was so primeval. And I walked, I kept on walking for something like two hours. And luckily I was a young man in those days. And finally, 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 I saw this huge sliver of rock 
there was a plateau, I got to a plateau, and then out of, the, out of this plateau was this sliver of rock, huge, about two miles long, most extraordinary sight. And I could see there was a little village, and I knew I had to go through the village, and the ashram was just the other side of the village. And I found myself going through this very primitive little village, and I could see the Devi temple, the Devi temple was kind of plugged into the rock, just like a light socket. And this place was very, this was very important. I knew that Prakashananda had done his sadhana for years in this place. And his inspiration was the Devi, the goddess. So when you talk about Prakashananda, you, you talk about Saptashrim, you talk about the goddess. This was his his focus and his guru, of course, Muktananda. And finally arrived in the ashram, and Dean was there. I was really happy to see Dean. And there was one other Western, a rather mysterious Canadian, and there was Babaji. And Babaji was in his home turf, and he was manifesting that guru principle in a tangible way. It wasn't like Ganesh Puri, where he was the humble disciple to his guru, Muktananda. He was, he was magnificent. He was in his magnificence. And he was free. And he was very powerful. And he was very beautiful. And he didn't talk all that much. And anyway, he said he didn't speak any English. And what I understood was the sadhana with, with Prakashananda for me at that time was just being with him. First thing he said was, did you get permission from Ganesh Puri to come here? No, Babaji, no I didn't. This was through a translator. And his, there was a, someone called Om Baba there who spoke a bit of English, who was a, uh, Babaji's disciple. You mean you came here without permission? Yeah, yes, Babaji. And I knew I was in trouble. He said, you can't come here without permission. You're going to go back to Ganesh Puri. And immediately I got, he's testing me. I just got it straight away. And he did it with such a humor and such a love and such a mastery that I was actually excited about being kicked out. And I think... I had to leave, it was either the next day or the day after I had to leave. I think he said, oh, you can, okay, you can stay two days, then you go. So with Prakashananda, there were these tests all the time. And there were tests that, in normal circumstances, would not be very pleasant. But because Prakashananda was who he was, it was like a privilege, in a way, when he turned up the heat and when he, when he tested you, which he did all the time, in one way or another. So I went back to Ganesh Puri and I got permission. Actually, I ended up by moving permanently to Saptashrin. So this was now 76 and I started my journey with him in earnest. I was meditating six hours a day. I was hanging out with him as much as I could. I was just watching him. I was watching the way he moved, the way he dealt with people. And really that's, that's all I needed to do at that point. And I meditated a lot. And some of the experiences of Shaktipat started to happen, I used to have. Kriyas, in other words, all sorts of movements, all sorts of visions, and I became permeated with the power of Prakashananda and Sabdashri and the whole lineage. And I would go up to see the Devi from time to time. The Devi was up, as I say, it's like a, it was a temple which was like plugged into the rock. And from that point, you could see for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. And you could see other mountains rolling off into the distance, 
the Western Ghats. It was an extraordinary time. And Babaji said, no money. I don't want any money. You've got to understand this is a very poor ashram. And Babaji says, no money. 